Well, about this time last year, St. Louis was treated to a grand opening of epic proportions. The Swedish furniture company, Ikea, moved into our town. Now, the store, in case you haven't seen it, is unbelievable. It features 350,000 square feet of retail space, a 450-seat restaurant, free childcare for shoppers, and 26 checkout aisles. Now, at the grand opening on September 30th of last year, customers drove in from all over the Midwest to see this shopping spectacle. Some of them waited outside in line for two days two nights to uh, receive a a door prize, which could include a free Ikea couch or a year's supply of meatballs. Now, even even the mayor was on hand, although instead of cutting a ribbon on their grand opening, the mayor participated in a Swedish log-cutting ceremony, which is apparently meant to bring the store good luck. That's how they open things in Sweden, I suppose. Now, nothing against Ikea. But it is amazing to me that people could get so excited about a furniture store coming to town. I mean, I know it's Ikea, but I don't get it. Ikea is basically painted plywood furniture that gets broken down into pieces so small that you can fit it inside of a pizza box. (laughs) You come back from the store with a pizza box, and everybody's excited because it's pizza night. But actually, no, children, that's your bedroom. That's not just your bed, that's, that's your bedroom. Now you have until college to assemble it. Furthermore, it can take such skill assembling IKEA furniture that it's hard to believe that the rumors aren't true, that the company was actually founded by the Norse god Odin in the year 825 as a way to search the earth for worthy warriors. (laughs) So sure, IKEA is cool, but I'm not sure the grand opening was, in the grand scheme of things, that big of a deal. I mean, personally, I don't think it's really what St. Louis needs. I'm sure you agree that what ails our lives in our city goes deeper than furniture. Now, if you pointed me in the direction of a grand opening that could actually offer something that could make our lives significantly better, well, then I'd be interested. If you invited me to the grand opening of a place that could feed your soul more than Swedish meatballs ever could, now that's a grand opening I'd make sure I was there for. That's a grand opening that I'd line up down the block to make sure I got in for, and I wouldn't even need a free couch to make it worth my while. If that's the sort of grand opening, then you'd be interested in. Well, then you are in luck this morning because that's the kind of grand opening that you're actually here for. We are here this morning to celebrate Rooftop's grand opening of our bigger, larger facility where we do more than sell painted plywood furniture. We are here to open this building to this city that we love as a place where people can get to know Jesus and meet the God that made them. Now, truth be told, this isn't actually a grand opening. As Jason and Jeremy have said, this is more of a grand reopening. If you didn't know, this rooftop's been around a while. Rooftop has been around for 16 years. We started way back in 2000. Way back in, whoa, I know. Way back in 2000, we were just a bunch of, a small little group of college grads who met in living rooms and basements around the city. And then we sort of had a plan, so we moved into the uh, Clayton Community Center for a while so we could kind of get organized. And then we outgrew the Clayton Community Center, so we moved over to the Richmond Heights Community Center over on Dale Avenue for a while. And then we found our new home here in Mid-South County over on uh, Weber Road. And we were over there for like 10, 11 years, way too long. And then we moved over here three weeks ago to our new building on Gravois Avenue. Now, why all the shuffling around? Why the move into this bigger, uh, newer location? Because as you know, if you were over at our old building, we've been out of room over there for quite some time. We were stuffed to the gills. We needed to make some more room. And that's actually the sermon series that we're kicking off this morning. The series is called Making Room. And the idea behind this series is that our lives get crowded. Our lives get crowded with lots of stuff, commitments, clutter, activities. And our lives are worse for it, too. Just because our lives are full and busy doesn't mean that they're filled with the right things. We need to make room for the important things. So during the next five weeks, we're going to talk about some of the important things that we need to make room for in our lives. Things like prayer. Things like grace, things like other people, things like Jesus, things like rest, you know, important stuff. But we're going to kick off the series here at our grand reopening by talking about one of the most important things that we need to make room for, and that's you. 
We need to make room for you. You are why we're having this grand reopening. You are why we moved into this larger facility. You are why we spent over $1.5 million on this joint. You are why we're here. Now, why would we do that? I mean, are you really that special? <laughs> why would we move into this building just for you? Because we're needy and codependent and we want you to like us? Well, actually, maybe. But really, we're making room for you for a very simple but very important reason. It's because you matter to God. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that, that directly, but you matter to God. Here at Rooftop, we worship the God of the Christian scriptures. And one of the things we believe about the God of the Christian scriptures is that he loves people. He loves people a lot. And he doesn't just love people a lot. He loves uh, every type of people a lot. He loves Christian people. He loves Muslim people, he loves Protestant people, he loves Catholic people, he loves agnostic people, he loves atheist people, he loves gay people, he loves straight people, he loves trans people, he even loves Cub fan people, if you want to call Cub fan people people. <laughs> God doesn't just love people, God loves all people. And God doesn't just love all people, God loves all terrible people. God loves people who have disobeyed and offended and ignored him. God loves people who have committed crimes and made mistakes and harmed themselves and others. The Bible calls these types of people lost people. And God really loves lost people. Lost people like you and lost people like me. In fact, Jesus tells a couple stories in the Gospels about just how much God loves lost people. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, Jesus compares God's love for lost people to a couple things. He compares God's love for lost people to, like, let's say, a shepherd who has a hundred sheep, and he loses one. You might know this story. Now, what does he do? Does he say, hey, 99 sheep's pretty good. That's a pretty good batting average. That one lost sheep, you know, he was kind of dumb. He was bound to get lost eventually. I'd rescued him too many times. No, what does he do? He leaves the 99, searches high and low, over hill, through valley, to find that one lost sheep until he finds him. Jesus also says that God's love for lost people is like a widow who has 10 silver coins. Now, let's say that widow loses one of her precious 10 silver coins. What does that widow do? Does she say, oh, well, 9 out of 10, that's pretty good. I can live for a while on 9 silver coins. No, she's a poor widow. She needs every single one of those silver coins, so she sweeps her whole house. She moves all the furniture out of her place until she finds that one lost coin. And then when she finds that one lost coin, she dials up all of her friends on her first century rotary phone <laughs> and tells them how excited he is that she found that one lost coin. Jesus says this is how determined God is to find lost things, to find lost people, and that's how excited he gets when he does. God loves lost people, and he loves them a lot. In fact, God loves lost people so much so that here's what he did. He came to earth as a man to tell us that. He came to earth as a man to tell us that and to show us how to live. And then he came to earth as a man to die for our sins so that we could be forgiven. And then he came to earth as a man to raise from the dead so that we could rise with him. Not a lot of people would do that. Not a lot of gods would do that. Come to earth to die for our sins. But the God of the Bible would and did. He sent Jesus to seek and to save the lost. Lost people like you. Lost people like me. Of course, this brings us back to the idea of making room. If you want to let lost people know that they matter to God, you've got to make room for them. I mean, if you know the life and the ministry of Jesus at all, his message of God's love for lost people attracted quite a following. Jesus was a preacher in the first century who went around showing and telling people about the love and the power of God. And as you can imagine, people showed up for that. People ate it up. People drove for miles around. They lined up around the corner to get in. Now, of course they would, right? Nobody had ever appeared on the scene like Jesus had who could speak so compellingly about the love of God for lost people. Huge crowds flocked to see and hear him. This was great, but unfortunately it did create some problems. There was the little matter of crowd control. Sometimes the crowds got so large and demanding that it created some issues. One time, for example, Jesus was preaching to a very large crowd by the Sea of Galilee. And so many people were pressing in to hear what Jesus had to say that they kept actually forcing him into the water. So he was preaching in the water. What did he do? He got in a boat. He rowed a little bit out, out ashore, and then he kind of kept preaching from the boat. 
Another time, a huge crowd of people had actually followed Jesus into the wilderness to hear what he had to say. They were so entranced by what Jesus had to say that they stayed there for three days and forgot to eat. Jesus got a little bit concerned that they were going to start falling over from hypoglycemic reactions. So what did he do? He took a few loaves and fishes, made a big meal for everybody to give them some energy so that they could keep listening. People love Jesus' message of God's love for sinners. They flocked to hear it. It's the same reason I'd like to think that we've got so many people here this morning, not just because we're in a nice new cool building, although it's nice and cool, but because you know that we're going to tell you a simple but important truth that you matter to God. That's an attractive message. It draws crowds. But these crowds did present challenges for Jesus. You know, eventually they might present some challenges for us. Which raises the question, how did Jesus make room for all these people? How are we going to make room for all these lost people in this city? I mean, we're slowly nearing capacity in our new building. We've been here for three weeks. How are we going to make more room? Well, we're going to make room the same way Jesus did. Jesus faced this problem. And in the Bible, Jesus makes room for lost people in three ways. By the way, if you're visiting us, they're laughing because that's not the last three-point sermon that you're going to hear at Rooftop. We believe in many things here at Rooftop. God, Jesus, the Spirit, Salvation, Bible, and the importance of three-point sermons. (laughs) So how did Jesus make room for lost people? Three ways. Let me share them with you. First, Jesus crams people in. He stuffs people in. If Jesus meets somebody who wants to be a disciple, he finds a place for them. He doesn't turn anybody away because of background or gender or personal history or nationality. The kingdom of God is too important to worry about silly things like crowding or personal space. He fits them in. He stuffs them in like a telephone booth, like a clown car. There's a story in the Gospel of Mark which illustrates this, for example. Jesus is out preaching at the home of a friend of his, and all sorts of people have come to hear what he had to say. It was kind of exciting. They were just packed to the gills, kind of like we are. But it was a little bit of a problem because visitors couldn't get in or out. And there was a group of guys who had a friend of theirs who was paralyzed. And they really wanted their paralyzed friend to get to Jesus so they could, Jesus could maybe do something about it, but there was no way they could get him in. So maybe you know what they did. What did they do? Climbed up on top of the roof. Dug a hole through the roof. There's a picture from the scene. Somebody was on hand to capture it. They dug a hole through the roof, and they lowered the guy down. Jesus was so impressed by their determination, he was so impressed by their boldness, by their faith, that uh, he healed the guy instantly, forgave him of his sins, and he healed the guy instantly, and the guy walked out in full view of them all. Now, that's pretty cool. But something else I really have always enjoyed and appreciated about the story is what Jesus did not say. He didn't look up, see a bunch of guys tearing a hole in a roof, and said, hey, 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 guys. That's somebody's roof. Don't do that. He didn't say, hey, the fire marshal says max occupancy is like 64. We're at like, you know, 220, so i got to draw the line somewhere. Keep your friend out. No, he welcomed him in. He crammed him in. He knows, he knows that there's always room for one more. It reminds me of my rooftop friends, Drew and Lindsay here. They're, in the, they're sitting in the back here this morning. Uh, they just finalized an adoption a couple weeks ago. They've got three, by the way, did you know that yesterday was official National Adoption Day? Anybody see that on, on Facebook? We've got a lot of adopting families here. My family has adopted somebody. Lots of people have, we believe in three-point sermons and adoption here, here at Rooftop. We're very excited about that. But, but Drew and Lindsay, they just finalized an adoption uh, a couple weeks ago. And what's crazy about it is that they're both busy, busy professionals, and they've got three active, busy kids. But they, you know, I don't know what sort of capacity they would have had to adopt a kid, but they felt the call of God to add somebody to their family, so they crammed him in. When you're running around crazy, you don't care about that sort of thing. You just, and you feel the call of God, you just cram them in. Jesus does that. He crams people in. I know it's crowded here this morning, but you know, that's what happens. You start preaching about the love of God for lost people. People start coming. People might, it might get crowded here. We're going to make, we'll tear off the roof. We bought this building. Maybe there's another one out there. In fact, it's kind of good to be crowded. Being crowded forces us to get to know each other and sit next to each other. You know as well as I do that sometimes we like space so that we don't have to sit next to people. You're welcome to sit in my row, but just don't sit right here. 
And I get it, we have personal space, but you tell me, you tell me honestly if your problem is really that there's too many people in your life who know you too well. Is that your problem in life? There's too many people in your life who just know too much about you. Yeah, I didn't think so. That's how Jesus made room. He crammed people in, sometimes more than what made them comfortable. How else does Jesus make room? He sends people out. Jesus is always sending people out. He crams people in, and then he sends people out. He brings people together, and then he sends them out. In Luke chapter 9, the author writes that when Jesus had called his disciples together, he gave them power, and he gave them authority, and then he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. He did this because he wanted to preach the gospel to other people who lived further away and hadn't heard it, but he also did it to create more room for new disciples. When my wife, Michelle, and I started Rooftop in 2000, before that, we were actually campus ministers up at Truman State University uh, up in Kirksville, Missouri. That's where we met. That's where we kind of got baptized. And while we were up there, we were campus ministers up at Truman State. And I loved working with college kids. That's what we did. We told college kids about the love of Jesus. I loved working with college kids. College kids are curious, and college kids are passionate. Any college kids here this morning? I just want to know a couple of you. Anybody know of a college kid here this morning? Anybody know the concept of college kid? Okay. Good, I guess. Anyway, I loved working with college kids. But one of the things I did not like about working, like about working with college kids is that it, it, it's really hard to make long-term relationships with college kids because they always just graduate, and they leave, and then they move on and live their life. It's really hard to build any sort of organizational momentum when you basically lose a quarter of your congregation every year. It's one of the reasons I decided I wanted to become a, a local church pastor because I thought you know, the turnover would, would not be as bad. As I've found out... <laughs> There might be even more turnover in the local church. People move on, people move away, people come and go at a rate greater than graduating college kids. It makes it very hard to build anything. Over time, though, I've actually come to see this as a good thing. I mean, the best we can do is to show people the love and the truth of God as long as they're here. Hopefully they get it. Hopefully they meet Jesus. Hopefully they get baptized. Hopefully they have an experience of the Spirit. And if the Spirit takes them on, well, that's great for the kingdom. That's great for the world. Hopefully they can take what they've learned here at Rooftop and do something with it. Maybe help start a church. Maybe lead someone to faith. Over the past 16 years, Rooftop has sent hundreds of people around the country, around the globe, where they're making a difference for Jesus. Besides which, if they had never left, we'd have even bigger space problems. What good would we do all clumped together telling each other how much God loves us? Not only are we depriving the world of that information, but we're taking up seats from people who need to hear about him more. One of the great things about this morning is uh, some of the old rooftoppers I've seen who have come back to help us kick off here and some of the other Christians from other churches in the area who are here to help us get going. And don't get me wrong, I am thrilled you're here. We invited you. Thanks for coming. But don't stay too long. Your community needs you. Your church needs you. Your family needs you. you. Your school needs you. And we need your seat. I'm officially sending you out again. I'm commissioning you to do what God has called you to do in your own community. Just make sure you get some lunch first before you leave. And if the rest of you, if there's ever a time you feel God sending you out, may he bless you on the way. It means the gospel is going out in exciting directions. It also means we have more room for more people. That's how Jesus makes room. He crams people in and he sends them out. And lastly, Jesus ticks people off. That's what he does. Crams people in, sends people out, ticks people off. I love this about Jesus. I love that he isn't afraid to tick people off or offend them or confuse them. You see, the way of Jesus is hard. It's attractive, it's exciting, but it's hard and offensive and confusing. Jesus calls it the narrow path. And not everybody really wants to take the narrow path. And when Jesus makes clear how hard it is, people can get ticked off and leave. This is unfortunate because they're missing out, but it's also a good thing because it makes room for people who are genuinely interested. In the Gospel of John, for example, another one of my favorite stories in the Gospel of John, one time Jesus was uh, preaching to a huge crowd, just a ginormous crowd that had been following him for for quite some time. And the crowd was actually becoming a little bit of a problem for Jesus. And Jesus suspected that this crowd wasn't actually interested in anything he had to say. He suspected that they were there for the spectacle of it. 
Uh, or, you know, the miracles. They wanted to see the miracles, like when Jesus made a big, nice big meal for everybody. So the crowd was becoming a little bit of a problem. And what did Jesus do? Did he build an education wing? And did he hire an associate messiah? No. He preached a hard message. He ticked them off. Here's what he said. He said, I tell you the truth. Anybody who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That's what he said. I tell you the truth. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now, really, all Jesus is saying is that we need to depend on Jesus uh, for eternal life as much as we depend on food for earthly life. That's really all he's, saying, all he's saying. We need to depend on Jesus as much as we depend on food. But the crowd didn't get it. They were thoroughly grossed out. What, eat your flesh? Drink your blood? What do you want us to do? Become vampire Christians? Cannibal Christians? And here's what John writes. From this time, many of his disciples turned back, no longer followed him. That's one way to make room. <laughs> Tick them off. I know we might get crowded here eventually, but the message of God's, because the message of God's love for you is just so attractive, and that message is true. That's going to attract people. But Jesus has lots of things to say to you and I. He has many hard teachings, and we might not like all of them. Would you come back next week? If I told you what Jesus has to say about divorce and adultery, would you come back next week if I told you what Jesus has to say about lust? Would you come back next week if I told you what Jesus has to say about hell? Would you come back next week if I told you what Jesus has to say about money or forgiving your enemies or carrying your cross and dying to yourself and following him? We've already been talking as a leadership team about what we might have to do if Rooftop uh, keeps growing. You know, do we expand? Do we start a new location? Do we start another service? And you know, we might have to consider all those. But I'm like, hey, first, why don't we try preaching the gospel? Why don't we try telling everybody about everything that Jesus has to say? And I mean everything that Jesus has to say. Let's try that. And then we'll see where we're at. So that's what this grand opening is all about. We're here to make room. We're here to make room for you because you matter to God. It's why we're here. It's why we move to make room for you. And that's how we're going to make room. We're going to cram you in more than what you're probably comfortable with. We're going to send you out so that you can share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people in the world who haven't heard it. And we're going to tick you off with all the love of God. Now, I could end there but I got one quick little thing. Can I do one quick little thing? Okay. Now, I started by telling you about Ikea's grand opening last year, which did so well. And my point is that this is far more important than that, and I hope you can appreciate that. But speaking of grand openings, uh, grand openings are nice, but they do tend to fizzle. It's easy to start big and go nowhere. For example, maybe you remember a little place called St. Louis Center. On August 5th, 1985, St. Louis Center opened its doors to the public in a grand opening, the likes of which had not been seen in St. Louis since the dedication of the Gateway Arch. St. Louis Center was the country's largest urban shopping mall. It was down on Washington Avenue. It promised to rejuvenate downtown and to halt the loss of shoppers and consumers to the county. Thousands of people showed up for the ceremonies, including comedian Bob Hope. Now, as you know, St. Louis Center did not last. It was shuttered in the early 2000s and redeveloped into a few things, including a parking garage. Now, theories of why exactly the shopping mall failed are many. Some people think that it failed because of competition from the Galleria. Some people think that it failed because there's just not enough people that live downtown to shop. Some people think that it failed because of crime. Some people think it failed because it just didn't fit into the urban landscape. Now, those are probably all true, but I want to believe that it didn't work because it's not actually what St. Louis needs. St. Louis doesn't need another mall. St. Louis doesn't need another stadium. St. Louis doesn't need another business park. St. Louis doesn't need another furniture store. St. Louis needs a church. A church filled with people who proclaim boldly from the rooftops 
everything that Jesus has whispered in our ears, that God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. That's why we're here. That's what St. Louis needs. That's why we're having this grand opening today. We've even invited our own local celebrity, Jeff the Juggler. He's no Bob Hope, but he's pretty good. That's why we're here. Now, I don't know how long we'll last. I don't know how long we'll be here. That's up to God. Two decades, in two decades, we might be a parking garage, which would be ironic because we probably could have really used the parking. (laughs) But for now, we're here, and we're here for you. We're here to make room for you. We're here to let you know that you matter to God. You matter to God so much so that he sent his son Jesus to die for your sins. You matter to God so much so that he built his church so you could meet and get to know him and his people. You matter to God, and you matter a lot, and you matter to us. If you want to hear more, come back next week. We'll keep talking. Let's pray.